Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, we thank you uh, for this time in your word. Lord, we thank you for the promises that are within your word. Lord, we thank you for the, the, the opportunity to come to you in prayer, Lord, to put requests at your feet, Lord, and you're big enough to handle all of them. And this morning, Lord, as a, as a body of believers, Lord, we come to you and we lift up Josiah, Lord, who, who drowned yesterday and was revived, Lord, but is fighting for his life right now. We just pray that you'd comfort his family. Mm-hmm. We pray that you'd heal his body. Lord, and we just pray that you would continue to keep him in our mind, Lord, that we would continue to pray for him today and throughout the week, Lord, that that he would recover. And for everyone around the situation, Lord, we pray that you would even use this this difficult circumstances to bring about um, a decision to follow Christ as Lord and Savior. Lord, that's a request we have for all of us, Lord. May you be our Lord and our Savior forevermore, Lord, and help us to reach out and be in unity with one another as we work together and look at your word this morning. We pray that you use Pastor Izzy now. Pray that just like that breeze is coming off the ocean, Lord, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit to overflowing, Lord, Mm -hmm. that we can go forth changed from this day on. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, guys. Would you turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15? And we've been going through this uh, passage of Scripture verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and we're We just got through verse 3 last week where we saw the things that, we broke it down into the things, the three things that Paul said were of first importance. When it comes to the gospel message, there's three parts of it, and he said they're all according to the scripture. And so we've done an in-depth study on verse 3, how these three things, who can recall what three things are there according to the scripture that are firstly important? If you don't know, you can look at verse 3 and read it for yourself for cheating. Uh, purpose. No, this is just a, you know what, I'm a teacher, so I don't mind repeating myself because this helps people, you know, when you get it recalled to mind and you revisit it, somehow it kind of deepens that, that bearing of that truth into your heart. And this is, if I was going to bury anything into the hearts of believers, it would be this verse in its depth, not just glazing over quickly, but saying, according to the scripture, the first thing it said was that Christ died for our what? Our sins. Man, if you don't understand, that's the most important thing of the gospel. The good news is that Christ died for our sins. We don't have to die for our sins. We don't have to do penance for our sins. Christ did the whole complete work, and when he was on the cross, the last words he said is, he says, it is what? Finished. The sacrifice for our sin was made complete at the cross. When Jesus hung on that cross and he gave up his spirit, he said, no man takes my life, I give it. He gave it as an offering that he would take on himself all of our pain, all of our suffering, and he would, it would go, it would go on him. And for that, we're so grateful that the Lord would, you know, allow this. So the Lord is, the Lord is here doing this. He says, the second part was that, not that he just, that he died, but that he, did, he was buried also for according to the scripture. And lastly, that he was raised on the third day according to the scripture. Now this is all, this is all done by the, by the scripture foretelling. God said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to send a, a Messiah to die for your sins. He's going to be buried and he's going to be raised from the dead. And without the last part, the resurrection from the dead... We're going to see Paul says in this chapter a little bit later, we won't get there today, but I'll just tell you coming up, he's going to say, if Christ wasn't raised, we are most to be pitied. I mean, this would be foolish of us to get together if Jesus didn't overcome death. It would be just like a great story of this guy that got beat up and, and crucified and, and then he got buried and he's still dead. If he was still dead, if the, I've been to Israel, by the way, and taken to the garden tomb where they laid Jesus and and guess what? It's empty. 
In fact, they, they had to put a door on the front of it that wasn't there originally. They put a wooden door because you guys remember the story. There was a great stone that was rolled over the mouth of the, uh, of the tomb. And <clears throat> that, that today they put a, a door just to prevent vandalism. But it's interesting on the door it says, he is not here. He is what? Risen. And they put Mark, you know, Gospel of Mark, the verse there. And I, I laugh. I go all the way to Israel. We are the only people that travel all the way from, from Hawaii to Israel is like about as far as you can get. The most remotest part of the piece of land away from Israel on the other side of the globe. And to the Jewish mindset, we are literally the remotest piece of earth that there is. And, you know, Jesus said that, God, that the, his disciples were going to become a, a witness First in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then even to the remotest parts of the... So I'm the fulfilling the last part. The remotest parts of the earth is where the gospel is being proclaimed. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus, Jesus died for us and was buried. But I went all the way there to find out it's empty. The tomb is empty. And I'm glad to tell you that because Christ is risen. He has been resurrected. Now, Paul is going to go on to say something that... He's kind of, um, how do I say, summing up the story in a really powerful way. He goes on and says that Christ first appeared, risen, to Cephas. That's another name for who? Peter. To Peter, the apostle. And then after he appeared to Peter, verse 5 says, then he appeared to the twelve. And then after that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom, he said, remain until now, but some, he said, have um, fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, and then to, the, to, to all the apostles, and then last of all, Paul says, as if unto someone who's untimely born, he appeared to me also. So he, he, he said, for I am least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And so he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace did not prove vain to, toward me, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. And he says, whether then it was I that, the, or, or they that, he says, it doesn't matter, so we preach to you, and so you believed. He said, Paul said, you know, remember Paul had already said, some guys were saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Peter, I'm of uh, Apollos, you know. Paul says, none of us were crucified for you. We're nothing. It's Jesus who's everything. You know, he, he points everybody back to Jesus. But interestingly enough, Paul says that Christ's resurrection, the fact that he rose, wasn't like an exclusive thing that only a couple people saw Jesus risen. He says that Jesus was seen risen and by Peter, which a lot of people, you know, look at Cephas or Peter as a biggie in the, in the you know, early church history. But who can tell me you know, each one, by the way, it says he, sh he showed up to Peter, then to the 12, then, then to more than 500 persons. Did you guys know that more than 500 people saw Jesus resurrected from the dead at once? And Paul said, most of whom, when he was writing the, the letter to the church of Corinth, most of whom were still alive to the very day that Paul's writing this letter. He says, there are people, more than 500, a few of them, he said, sleep. That means a few died. That's their way of saying, you know, like a real sleep. <laughs> that, my, I always tell my kids, look, you know, I don't get enough sleep in the day, I, I mean, in life as it goes, but it's okay, I'll sleep later. You know, meaning like when I'm dead, I'll sleep. But, but that's like permanent sleep. That's what he's talking about. He said, but those guys, most of them are still here, the ones that saw Jesus risen. Now, why would you, why would you say Peter saw him, then the 12 saw him, then more than 500 saw him risen from the dead? And then all of them together saw him again, all the apostles. And then, and then James, he said, saw him. And then lastly, like one untimely born, I saw him. risen. Now, I'm going to go over when Paul saw him in a future study. Because this is a really powerful thing. A lot of folks don't know the testimony of Paul, but it's recorded for us in Acts. In fact, if you're a student of the Bible, you're probably going, hey, wait a minute, most of these... These um, appearances are all recorded for us. Like, when did, when did Jesus show himself risen from the dead after, after he had died and been buried? When did he show himself to Peter? Does anything come to mind? 
when did Peter see Jesus resurrected from the dead? And it, uh, hopefully, you know, you Bible students are going, oh, I know, I know. Beach. Me, m on the beach, there by the Sea of Galilee? Yeah, there's one. When he had the fish, remember, he said, they said, it, it's a ghost. And he goes, you, you know, he had already laid out the supper. They had fished all night. He said, haven't caught anything, have you? And they go, no. Why don't you put your net on the other side? Now, now this should have been deja vu for these guys, because remember three years earlier, when they, when they first were called to follow Jesus? Jesus said, can I borrow your boat? A lot of crowd here, I'm going to preach. And when they're all done mending their nets, he goes, put your net out um, for a catch. And they go, look, we fished all night. Didn't catch anything. And you're a good rabbi, you know, nice teacher, but, you know, we're fishermen. We, we, we do this for a trade. This is our living. And he goes, go, go ahead. And Peter goes, oh, well, all right. Just to humor the, the rabbi, we'll go ahead and put our... And he put his net out. What happened that first time? Remember, the, the nets were so full that they were putting in the fish into the boats and the boats began to sink. Now, that's my kind of fishing, you know. I mean, we live in Kona. It's a fishing community. Can you imagine catching so many fish that the boat is taking on water because it's down at the water line? It's so full of fish. And when they get to shore, Jesus says, leave that. No longer are you going to be fishing for fish. I'll make you fishers of what? Men. Now, three years later, he dies, he's buried, he r rises from the dead, and he tells his disciples, go up to Galilee, I'll meet you there. And they get up to the lake, the Sea of Galilee, and they, you know, this is where Peter and James and John were, that's, this is home base for them. This is where they fished their whole, before they came to follow the Lord, and he's gone. Jesus has been crucified. He's been buried, and some women have come in the morning and said, hey, we were at the tomb, it's empty. And um, there's these angels, and they said that he is not here, he is risen. And we're perplexed, and what's it mean? And John and Peter did the running to the tomb, and, you know, John tells us that he got there first. And then Peter got there later, Johnny come lately, but he went, Peter went in. And he saw it so, and he saw that the, 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 the cloth was there with the head piece all folded off to the side by itself. And so he went on his way, Peter did, and this is the part I want to show you. Some people aren't familiar with this part, but it's really important. You know, if someone would say to you, when did Peter get a visit from Jesus risen? Peter himself. Because Paul says Peter got a, like a personal visit. And a lot of folks, don't, they don't key in on this. And I'll tell you why. It's because Peter didn't just have one name in the Bible. And this is what's confusing to me when I was a new Bible student. I was like, what, what's his name? It's Simon Peter, right? Simon in, in Hebrew means um, shifting sand. Simon, shifty, like, um, like, the, like the sand behind me that's right by the, where the water is coming in and washing up on the shore and then goes back down. And if you look at the sand, it gets pushed this way and then back with the backwash. And then this way and back with the backwash. That moving sand, that shifting sand, that right there in Hebrew would be called Simon. Okay? Simon. Okay? How would you like that for your name? Hey, shifting sand. <laughs> Jesus said, you know, when, when he came to follow Jesus, Jesus says, we're not going to call you shifting sand anymore. We're going to call you something else. What did he call him? Petra. Petra, which is a rock, a stone. No, forget shifting sand. It doesn't really suit you. We're going to call you stone, like, you know, a rock, like solid. And this is what happens when Jesus comes into your life. He can take you from being, you know, that shifty character into that solid character. So he says, you're going to be called, you're going to be called Peter. We, we say that the, the Greek was Petra. He said, but in English we say Peter. So in the Bible you might read about him and go, which one is he? Or Cephas. Another translation is Cephas. And so you're going, what's the guy's name? You know, it's all of them. If, I was, if you were writing a story about me and you put, and his name was uh, Pastor Izzy, people go, oh yeah, we know who he is. But if they said my full name, Isidoro, which I, a lot of people back east can say it, but out here they don't even do more than two syllables. Well, I mean, Izzy got shortened to Iz when I moved to Hawaii 26 years. They, they go, what's your name? And I go, it's uh, Isidoro. They go, how about Iz? I go, well, I've been called Izzy. Only my nona called me Iz. And, and it was really weird to hear other people call me Iz other than my, you know, elders of my family. Like, I was like, whoa, well, I don't know you that well, but... But if you said is or Isidoro or, you know, 
is he, it would be the same guy. And if you were telling the story and you just interchange the names, don't get tripped out because the nickname is used or the name what Jesus called him was used. That doesn't matter. It's the same guy. And this is why some people don't catch the part I'm going to teach you today. If you'll turn with me to Luke's gospel, Luke tells us something really interesting. And, uh, well, you guys turn to Luke, and while you're doing that, you can turn to the last chapter of the, of the gospel of Luke. I'm going to quickly show you a verse in Mark chapter 16. If you're taking notes, you can write verse 7, Mark 16, verse 7. Um, the gospel of Mark, we're told that Mark's gospel, if you, if you read it, you'll find out John Mark wasn't one of the apostles with Jesus. He was one of the young lads that went on the missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas. And, but um, he also was taken under his under wing by, um, by the, the apostle Peter. So a lot of the things that Mark tells us in his gospel is almost like, it's almost cheating. It's like getting to hear the story that Peter told. You know, like through Peter's uh, eyes, what he saw, what he records for us. John Mark got to hear all about Jesus through Peter. And that, that would be pretty, can, who here would volunteer to have Peter as your, your main discipler for your faith? You just come to faith, you need someone to disciple you, you know, you need a little mentoring. Who, who do you pick? Peter. You know, that would be a pretty good guy. Okay, so John Mark writes the Gospel of Mark. And in chapter 16, we read this. It says that the women, when they came early the first day of the week, verse 2, they, um, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they were saying to one another, who's going to roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? We can't. That stone is huge. It's heavy. And looking up, they saw that the stone had already been rolled away even though it was extremely large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. Now, I like that Peter actually tells us, the women looked over, and there's this young man. You guys know this from the other Gospels. Who's the young man? It's an angel. Remember, an angel can take on any appearance. This isn't an angel that took on the old, bearded, you know, he's a, he looks like a young man. And you got these young ladies going there to get the, to get the tomb all prepped and uh, Jesus' body prepped, actually, for burial. And they get there. They're not going to have to do any work anyway because he's not there. But it says, entering the tomb, they saw the young man sitting there and they were amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who has been crucified and he has risen and he is not here. This is the verse. He has risen and he is not here that is on the door in Israel today, on the little wooden door they put right there. And it says, Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and tell, who's it say? Peter. Wait a minute, it wasn't Peter one of the disciples? That he is going to go ahead of them to Galilee, and there you will see him just as he told them. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them, and they saw nothing, they, I'm sorry, they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, after he had risen early on the first day of the week, he then appeared to Mary Magdalene, the one who had had the seven demons cast out of her. Remember, she stayed behind, and she supposed him to be the gardener. You know, tell me where you've taken him, and I'll carry his body. And, the, and Jesus only had to say one thing. What did he say to her? Do you guys remember in John's Gospel? He said, Mary, just her name. And the way he spoke her name, she went, oh, it's the Lord. Only he says it that way. It'd be like my Nona saying, is. I know it's her. You know, it, I mean, just the voice of Jesus saying her name, she knew. She grabbed onto him. She wasn't even going to let him go. He says, let go. I haven't ascended to my father yet. You know, hang on, lady. But, but I have to appear to a few more guys. And we're, we're told, now, this is, the, this is the beauty. If you study the scripture enough, you start to see some really cool things about this day that Jesus, you know, when they went to the tomb and, and how he started to reveal that he was risen. And this, by the way, it tells us in this chapter that they actually didn't quite get the whole resurrection deal yet. Nobody had done this. It was like kind of new. I mean, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. And, I, and a lot of people were following, the, the crowds were following going, hey, 
can we can we um, talk to Jesus? And also, can we talk to that guy Lazarus? So, did you see a light? Or how was it for four days dead? You know, I mean, they all wanted to to find out about this guy Lazarus. But Jesus has raised from the dead, and he shows up first to the ladies, and and, and to Mary Magdalene, the one that had the demons, and then this is the part that I find fascinating. Mark tells us that that the angel said, "Go tell his disciples," and. Peter. Now, why and Peter? Why, why does Peter get by name? He didn't say and John or and Tom. What? Say it again. Okay, yeah, back up just a, just a couple chapters to chapter 14. And he had denied that he even knew the Lord those three times before the cock crowed twice. Remember, the, the, just, just to, if you go back in, this, in the Gospel of Mark, to chapter 14, you'll see that Jesus told him, you're, you know, he's like, I'll go with you to death. And Jesus says, I'll tell you the truth, you're going to deny you even know me. Three times before the cock crows twice. And, and you read the, the, in Mark 14 that immediately when that, that third time, when he was asked, you know, oh, you're one of his disciples. And he starts, verse 71, he began to curse and say, I don't know this man. I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus made that remark to him. Before a rooster crows twice, you will deny me thrice. And he says, and he began to weep. Peter, the last time he saw Jesus, he had just, I mean, can you imagine Jesus looking over at him and there he had just denied him? They lock eyes. And Peter tells us in, in um, sorry, in Matthew's gospel, says he went out and he wept bitterly. I don't think he thought he was going to deny the Lord, but, but the last time that he had seen the Lord, he was denying him. And I know he, in his heart, said, no way, I will, I'll go to death with you. And yet, Jesus knew him better than he knew himself. He said, you're going to deny me. And so here he is, in his, uh, 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 he's having an angel tell Mary, go make sure that the disciples know I'm going to meet him. And Peter. Now, why and Peter? What, what, what about Peter? Where did Peter go? I'm going to show you. This is the part we go to Luke's gospel to find out. Remember, Luke said, I, I did a careful investigation of all the things so I could write to you, O most excellent Theophilus, about all the stuff Jesus began to do and to teach. And So he writes the gospel of Luke with great detail and a lot of historical um, accuracy. He did a lot of homework. He was a doctor. He wasn't one of those schmucks. I mean, he like really did his homework. And he writes about the things that went on when Jesus died. And he tells us something really interesting. If you'll turn to the last chapter of Luke with me. Very well, last one. Chapter 24 of Luke. You'll see it in verse 13. Well, actually, verse 11, the, the, 10, the women came and they told the, the, the apostles that, that what they had seen at the tomb and uh, Peter ran, it says, to the tomb, and stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings only. And he went away to his what? Home. His home. Just a little detail to point out. And he was marveling at what had happened. He was like, man, it's empty. And the, and the cloth was, you know, his, his linen wrappings were hollow, and then over here was his headpiece. That, By the way, you know the Shroud of Turin is not the actual thing of Jesus because the Bible would easily disprove it. it says that his head wrapping was folded and in a place to the side it wasn't on the on the rest of the of the what we say mummy shape you know it was over to the side so that some people ask me do you think the shroud of turin is really the thing of jesus and they're going and the dna tested it and i'm like so what you have the dna bank from jesus's day and i'm sorry to tell you this it ain't the right guy and they're like how can you be so sure because i have eyewitnesses that were there would you rather go with an eyewitness who was there or with some guy who says he knows better 2,000 years later because he studied it? I got news for you. I'm going with the guys who was there. You know, I mean, in a, in a court of law, which one would you go with? For the, the eyewitness, right? We don't go with some guys. Exp we have an expert testimony. You know how they hired those experts and tell them what to say. Like every time they do expert testimony, I'm like, yeah, right. Shake my head like, forget this. You know, they, like they really know. Go with the guy who was there. Now, Peter, 
He's marveling, scratching his head. But verse 13 tells us something that some of you might not have keyed in on. Look at this. We're going to just read this, this part of Scripture because this is really the key to, to finding out about Peter. It says, And behold, two of them were going on that, that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Now they were talking with each other about the things which had taken place. Now while they were talking and discussing, it says, Jesus himself approached, and he began to travel with them. But it says their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. It says, and he said to them, what are these words that you're exchanging with one another while you're walking? And they stood looking sad. And one of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? Now, isn't this interesting? It says that their eyes were prevented from recognizing who he was. Now, what is, that's a clue. If their eyes were not somehow kept from understanding it was him, this indicates they would have known who it was. So they must have known Jesus before he died and was... So the, the two fellows in, that are walking, one we know his name right here is Cleopas. And he's going, are you, are you an idiot? I mean, like, are you the only guy that doesn't know? Don't you watch the news? I mean, are you not tuned in? We, listen, he said, verse 19, and I love Jesus. Like, are you not aware what happened? Jesus goes, what things? Like, like, play stupid. No, what things happened? And they said to him, the, the things about Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty indeed. And in word and in the sight of God and all the people. And how the chief priests and, and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death. And they crucified him. But we were hoping it was he who was going to redeem Israel. And indeed, besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. And also, some women amongst us, when they were at the tomb early in the morning, and they didn't find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels. And that... that that he, they said he was alive. And some of us, of those who were, who were with us, went to the tomb, found it just exactly as the women also had said, but him they did not see. So he said to them, O foolish men, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ was to suffer these things, to enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses... And with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Man, I am so jealous. This is the one Bible study of Bible studies I would like to have on tape. Can you imagine having Jesus teach concerning himself all that he would have to do according to the prophet, the law and the prophets, Moses, everything that he fulfilled when he came? I mean, he, by the way, I know this was a banking good study. I mean, this is like way up there. I, you know how I know? Look at this. Read just a little further down. It says, that as they approached the village that they were going to, he acted as though he was going to go on farther. But they urged him, saying, stay with us, for it's getting toward evening, and the day is nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. That's, the, that's by the way, the custom there in the Middle East. If you're traveling, you know, and you, it's getting towards dusk, you know, you say, hey, look, it's too far to the next place. S you know, stay over here. And you extend hospitality, you know, place to sleep and, and a meal. So they went in, and he reclined at the table with them, and then he took the bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he began giving it to them. And as soon as he did, what happens in verse 31? Their eyes are opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And then it says, they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us. Now, what was he explaining? We know the topic of the sermon. We just don't get all the details. The topic was that the Christ would have to suffer these things to enter into his glory. That topic is something people don't even want to preach today, that Christ suffered for our sins. They just go, Pastor, that's distasteful. You know, we don't want to hear about the gore. They beat him. They whipped him. They put him on that whipping post. And they, screwed, they pounded the crown of thorns into his, you know. That's, that gets gory. Just, can't you go to happy? 
you know, like, I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay, let's just go into something happy to talk. No. Because the very thing that is the heart of the gospel, the thing that gets me not have to pay for my own sin, is guess what? He paid. On that cross, he took all of my pain. By his stripes, we are what? We're healed. It was him that took all the burden. I don't mind preaching that Christ suffered for our sins. Because people, they like gloss over the most important thing. He did the suffering for us. Now, to me, that's good news because I always tell people, I'm allergic to pain. You know, I try to avoid it at all costs. And if Jesus was willing to take it on himself so I wouldn't suffer, I say, thank you, Lord. But if you're not going to tell people the, the very message that Jesus preached to them on the road, and they said it was a good message, were not our hearts burning within us? Can, you ever heard a sermon where it really stuck in your heart where you're like, man... That's just what I needed here. That is like, it just, it, it ignited something and put a fire in your heart. This is what they were saying. Our hearts were burning while he was explaining that he would have to suffer for our sin. And he gave them the, the, the scriptures from the Old Testament, our Old Testament, and told them this. And, and then it says, they got up that very hour and they returned to Jerusalem and they found gathered together the eleven and those that were with them, it says, saying, the Lord has really risen, and he has appeared to who? Simon. So who do you think the other of the two that were walking? We know Cleopas was one. I submit to you, it was Simon. The two guys on the road that went to the other town seven miles away after Jesus died that day, or rose that day, I'm sorry, in the morning, was Simon had run to the tomb, seen it was empty, and went, let's go home. This is a weird day. Cleopas, you want to go for a walk? I'm going home. Let's go over to me. And they had seven miles out of town. And Jesus is like, you're going the wrong way. That's okay, I'll meet you on the way. This is a cool thing about the Lord. He meets each one of us where we're at. He met Simon with Cleopas on the road that day. And he said, look, wasn't it necessary? And now, think about this. If it was Simon and Jesus came walking up, and Jesus didn't cause them to have that, that blinder to the fact who, who he was. I, I love that he could do this. I may think it's hard for Jesus to, to be there and blind them to the fact that it's really him. I mean, did he like put on a costume or did he just look different in his appearance? Or did he just make it so they just didn't perceive? You know, sometimes you can have someone sitting right next to you and you just don't perceive, you know, you, I, I've been at, 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 a, at a ball game, and the, the person said, didn't you know you were sitting next to the governor of, the, of Arizona? Well, this is when I lived in Arizona. The governor was in, in the stadium right, right in front of you? And I'm like, I was watching the game, you know? Has anyone ever had that? Like, you can be unaware of something that's right next to you. And I just crack up because in this case, Jesus was walking with them and talking with them. And they're going, are you, don't you know what happened? What, are you the only guy? And <laughs> it's so funny to me because Jesus plays along. He's like, really? He goes, what things? And he goes, um, they, 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 they took him and they beat him and they, and they crucified him and, they, and then they buried him. And, and then some women showed up and the women told us that he's alive and an angel said he's not, you know, dead. And well, it is a weird day. We're going home. Cleopas, you want to go? And Simon, who went to the grave, is dug out. And Jesus comes walking up. Hey, guys, what's happening? What, are you stupid? Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know what's happening? He's like, no, what, ha what, what, what What do you mean, what things? Did Jesus not know what had happened to him? Of course he knew. I find it ironic that the great teacher, that's what they called him, Rabboni. In Hebrew, that means great teacher. Rabbi is teacher. Rabboni is great teacher. The great teacher plays stupid. Really? What things? What, what happened to him? What's the big deal about him? Oh, we thought he was the one who's going to redeem Israel. And they killed him, and then he's gone now. He's vanished. Oh, that's too bad. You know, he is walking along with them. Can you just picture this in your mind? 
Jesus walking along with them and they don't know it's him till they get in there and they have supper and he takes the bread and he blesses it and he breaks it and he gives and they go wait a minute we know a guy who blesses the bread just like that and he broke the bread and, he gave, and poof he's gone what did they do? they get up you guys know the rest right? They run all the way back to Jerusalem, seven-mile trek. This is, you know, for Aaron, my, my runner in the group, doing his running analogies. These guys, I bet they hightailed it back to Jerusalem. And they find the apostles, and they're all together, and they go, we've seen the Lord. He's risen. He has appeared to, and they don't say Cleopas, because Cleopas, I guess he went one of the, you know, 12, so he's not the big important one. But he's appeared to Simon. Shifting sand saw him. That's what, I mean, Thomas wasn't with them, so he says, you know, <clears throat> it says right here, now, it says first he appeared to Cephas, Paul says, and then he appeared to, look back at Acts, I'm sorry, Corinthians 15, and next week I'm going to go over the rest of these appearances, but, well, not, <laughs> bear with me, it might take me a little bit more than one study to do all the rest of the appearances, but the ones recorded what Paul gave us. First he appears to Cephas, then to the twelve. Where's the, where's the appearance of the twelve? Well, just read the, just continue where we were in Luke. They said, the Lord really has appeared to Simon. Verse 35, and then they began to relate the experience on the road, how he was recognized by them by the breaking of the bread. They, <laughs> can you imagine them telling the story to the guys? Well, we were with this guy and he was telling us all about how the Christ would have to suffer and everything. And it was a really good message. Our hearts were burning and we still didn't know who it was until he broke the bread. feel like an idiot. Kind of missed that one. By the way, have any of you ever experienced where you're, you're talking to someone about the Lord and how the Lord is with us in our day-to-day -day life? You know, Jesus... Um, you know, he, he, he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, right? He leads me by the still waters. He restores my soul. You guys know Psalm 23, right? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Why? Thou art, what? With me. Have you ever tried to share this with somebody that's a believer? Hey, don't worry, the Lord is with you. And they're going, I don't see him. I don't think he's really there. You don't understand the problems I'm going through, man. This has been a confusing day. You know, yesterday, he was in a grave. Today, the grave is empty. I don't think he's really around. And who, where is he in this story? Right there. Sometimes, he's right there for believers around you, and they don't see him. They don't perceive that the Lord is right there with them. You know, guys, i got news for you. Jesus is with, with us all. And there are Christians who go, yeah, but I, I'm going through some hard times and I don't think he's really here. He ain't changing the fact he's still there. He's there. They just didn't perceive it. Now, isn't it interesting the Bible actually thinks on these guys? That they, this is what tells me this is a real story. Not a made up thing. Because if this is men making up the story, men would be like, yeah, and we spotted him right away because, you know, we're so spiritually in tune. We know, you know, as soon as he started talking the scriptures, it was him. No. This just shows the, the reality that even his own, even Peter, Peter who was there with him at the Last Supper, Peter who was there at, with him at, when the fish sunk the boat in the beginning, Peter was there with him all three years through his public ministry, didn't even recognize who he was when he was resurrected. So if you have a friend that says, well, I'm just having trouble recognizing him, I tell him, don't worry. You're in good company. You could be one of the apostles. You know, they didn't recognize him either. But it didn't stop Jesus from helping them to open up their minds to understand. And when we read on it here, it says, then they began to relate the experience, how he was recognized by the breaking of bread. And then in verse 36, it tells us, and while they were telling these things, he himself stood there in, his, in their midst and he said to them, Shalom. Or we say in English, peace. Peace be with you. And they, they were startled. They were frightened. They, they thought they were seeing a ghost, a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? They thought it was a ghost. 
Jesus said, see my hands, see my feet. It's, touch me, see that it is me. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when, they had sa- when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And then it says they gave him a piece of broiled fish. He took it and he ate it before him. Now, why did he do that? You, you guys, how many of you know what, uh, this is going to date myself. How many of you saw the cartoon Casper the Ghost? When we were kids, they had this little Casper the Ghost uh, cartoon. And he would try to eat something. What would happen to the food when he put it in his mouth? Nom, nom, nom. And it, poof, fall right through him onto the floor. Because a spirit can't eat. It would just, you know, pass through it. I mean, there's a spirit. Jesus goes, you got something to eat? And he eats a piece of fish in front of them, and they see it, and it doesn't fall through them into the floor, so they know it's really him resurrected. He was giving them a proof, but it was a little freaky to them because he was showing them the holes in his hands and the hole in his side, and it says he was risen. He was risen flesh and bone, not flesh and blood. What happened to his blood? He shed it to pay for our sins. So the blood isn't in him. There's a little freaky, you know, got open holes and you're going, look, it's me, I'm alive. They're like, I don't know. He goes, stick your hand in there. Now one guy wasn't with him. Who was that? Thomas. And Thomas, when they're going to tell him, we've seen him, we've seen the Lord, he, we saw the holes in his hands, we saw the hole in his side, the holes in his feet. And Thomas says, I ain't, <laughs> this is how trusting these guys were of each other. I don't care what you guys say. I don't believe you till I stick my finger in the holes in his hand. And I stick my hand in his side. And we read in the scriptures, eight days later, Jesus, when they're all together again, he appears. And this time Thomas is with him. And what's the first thing Jesus says to Thomas? Shame on you, Thomas. Didn't believe your, you didn't believe Peter or John? Tis, tis, no, he didn't do that, did he? He didn't even touch that. He says, Thomas, come here. Go ahead, stick your finger in there. Stick your hand in my side. Go ahead. See, it's me. And be thou no longer unbelieving, but be what? Believing. It's just me. Yes, I am alive with holes in me. I am alive flesh and, did you catch that flesh and bone? Didn't say flesh and blood like we think of. Flesh and bone. The blood had been drained. Now, can God appear resurrected and still have life even though the life is in the blood and the blood has been spilt? This is the true power of resurrection. See, some people say, well, yeah, there's people that have died and come back to life. I submit to you, they still have their blood. How many have died, lost all their blood, come back to life, and appeared and said, here I am alive? Only one. Jesus. Because he spilt his blood for our sin. The Lamb of God poured out that blood. That's why we have all those hymns. What can wash away my sin? What's the answer? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? What's the answer? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me what? White as snow. That blood. And... You know, today people are saying, Pastor, don't talk about the blood. That's distasteful. Dude, the blood is what washes away my sin. Isaiah said, though my sin be as scarlet, he will make it white as what? As snow. What a beautiful thing the Lord does for us through the shedding of his blood. But these guys, this was a rough day. They're like, "Um, you know, uh, the women said that he's... An angel said he's risen, and we don't know. And Peter said, ah, Cleophas, let's get out of here. And Jesus appeared to them. And then he appeared to all of them, except Thomas wasn't there, this, this one. But it says, then he, he said, give me something to eat. Now, verse 44 tells us, now, and we're going to end with this part of the scripture today. He says, he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you that all the things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, they all must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer 
and rise again from the dead on the third day. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. He said, you are my witnesses to these things. And behold, I am sending you forth the promise of my Father upon you. Now you stay in Jerusalem in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. <coughs> and so we, t we see the Lord telling them, you're going to be my witnesses. Matthew tells us from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the remotest parts of the earth, the Great Commission, you'll be my witnesses. But wait till you have what? The Holy Spirit, the one that will give you the power. Wait here and I'll send him. Now Jesus goes after this, it says, and he ascends. He takes them to Bethany and he lifts up his hands. He blesses them. And while he is blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they were worshiping him as they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continuing in the temple, praising God. This is the sum up from Mark as, as he learned it from Peter, that what went down, that, that Jesus first appeared to them on the road, Cleopas and himself, and then he appeared to all of them, and then he says, and then he explained to them all that was written. Now, I wish I could have listened in on that sermon. That's the one day, unfortunately, they don't give us all of the, you know, I wish that, probably because it was probably an all-day sermon. You know, our culture wouldn't like this sermon. I dig this sermon. I don't care. I mean, when I was a new Christian, I couldn't get enough. I was just talking with my wife, just, just as we were out walking the dogs this week, about how when I was a new Christian, I remember 35 years ago, there was such a hunger to know about Jesus that we'd go to Bible studies every night of the week. Didn't matter which fellowship, we just hopped, you know, go, we got to hear the word, man. We want to learn about the Lord. And Bible studies, we, we had Bible studies that went on two, three hours. And people would be like, don't stop, don't stop. You just keep going. We want to learn this. And today you go over 20 minutes. They're like, you need to stop, man. You know, you're really good. This is a long, this is really long, man. You got 35 minutes. You should, you're a long windbag. You know, what's the matter with you? Man, I can tell you there were times when three hours went by in a blink. There's just such a cool thing. And I don't know about you. I don't care how long Jesus would have preached this sermon. How, who would like to have heard Jesus explain concerning himself? from all Moses, from the Psalms, from the prophets. Who would want to sit in that sermon with me? I mean, I'd be like, Sam, just, if we had a teleporting machine, or what, what do you call it, the time traveler, I'd like to try and travel to this day and sit in on this sermon. I'd have material for you guys from now on till, till the Lord's return. Because they come back and go, let me tell you what he said concerning himself in the scripture. Wouldn't that be a sweet thing? This is the thing. But it doesn't tell us all that. And one thing I learned from Pastor Chuck Smith, he taught, he taught at a pastor's conference once. He said, you know, too many guys are too interested in what it doesn't say and not what it does. And that's a flaw. Don't ever go there. You know, sometimes the devil will try to trip you up with, well, what about this? And it doesn't say about that. You know, like, let's get into these areas it doesn't say about. You know what I've learned to say? Forget that. Let's stick to what it does say. And you know what it does say in the next verse? Verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the scripture. This is something that we can't gloss over. It says it right here. Who is the one who opens our minds to understand the things of God? Jesus. The Son of God is the one who who opens your mind. And if you want to gloss over him or you want to say, well, I'm going to approach God, but I don't want to go through Jesus. You know, there's many ways to God. I, I'm going to go a different road. Forget it. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one gets to the Father except through what? Me. Wow, he's narrow-minded. <laughs> now, you either have to be right on that one or you're a blasphemer. And I did a little homework. I'm pretty sure he was right. And the thing is, is that we need to be able to tell people Jesus is that way. Don't worry. But some people don't understand. And they're like, I don't get it. I don't get any of this stuff you're talking about. And I just tell them, you know what you got to do? You got to ask Jesus to open up your mind to understand. 
you need to ask the one who is the central focus of all these prophecies, the one who is the central focus of all these scriptures, the one who the scripture says in Hebrews chapter 10, Lo, it is written of me in the, what? The whole of the scroll. Or the English we say the volume of the book. Who it is written of? Who is the whole story about? Jesus. You know, the pastor, John Higgins, I talk about him often, who mentored me, he said, he said that, you know, all of this whole book is about Jesus. I used to come to work and I was the, I don't know, first I was the youth leader and then the youth pastor and then the assistant pastor and associate. They gave me different titles. It didn't matter. Just take care of the people. But I get to work and you go, so where did you see Jesus in the scripture today? And we had the daily Bible reading schedule we have out for you, you know, the Old Testament, three chapters a day, and the New Testament, one chapter a day. And he go, where'd you see Jesus? And I could always tell him that where I saw him in the New Testament. They go, that's really good. How about the Old Testament reading today? I was like, uh, it was Isaiah something? I didn't get it. Now, it's a real cool thing to have John Higgins for your mentor when you don't get it. So you know, like the walking prophecy Bible dude. I mean, I had the guy who'd be like, oh, you don't get that? Here, let me show you. And he would explain to me that scripture in Isaiah, that obscure passage that I thought, I don't understand this at all. And he'd be like, oh, that's about Jesus. Let me show you how it points out Jesus. And pretty soon I got to where I was like, wait a minute, this whole thing's about Jesus, isn't it? He's like, now you're on it. This whole thing is about Jesus. This whole story, all the stories point us to that kinsman redeemer. You know those, the story of Ruth and Boaz and, and all those, the, the love stories and all this. You think, well, it's just a love story. No. In the Jewish tradition, it's shadows and types to teach a truth. You use those shadows and types to explain a greater truth. You know, the shadow isn't the important thing. The shadow is just a two-dimensional thing that's made from a three-dimensional, the shadow of this tree over here. People go, well, I'm going to study the shadow. Why? Because I can see what shape it is. And have you ever done the little shadow thing with the little, make the little barking dog? You know, I can do that right here. On the sand, there's a little dog down there from my hand. But we used to do that, and it's so funny because it's like this, you know. But when you look at it in flat, it looks like a little dog on the thing. How many used to do that? You know, the butterfly and the little things. And you, can, you can look at the shadows and think that's the big deal. No, the shadow is to show you the greater thing, the shape of what is above in the three-dimensional. And God uses shadows and types in the Old Testament to teach us the greater thing in the spiritual realm. When he made, told Moses, he said, make this temple exactly according to the pattern which I show you from where? Heaven. So when they made the temple, why did they make that temple? It was laid out exactly in a certain way. Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. Why was all that stuff supposed to be exactly according to a pattern, which is where? In heaven. Because we're really good with models. We're like, I don't get the heavenly stuff. He goes, look at the model. You want to see how it's laid out? This is how it's laid out. We learn from those things. And all of these things are there to point us to Jesus. And John Higgins would be like, so where did you see Jesus in the reading today? Now some of you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I don't mean this in a bad way, but how many of you have a habit, of, a practice of picking up your Bible on a regular basis and reading it? Because we were just talking about this on the fr family night on Friday night. The reason we read the scripture in, in Romans 15 is that we get encouragement. And that encouragement brings what? You know, what was it that brings? Hope. And hope does not disappoint. And we got a society that doesn't have hope. You know why? Because we're not being tell, told to read this book. They took the book away from the kids in school. I saw a post on Facebook that was interesting. It had the book taken away from kids in school, but the book is being given to prisoners in prison. And it said something like, wouldn't it be better if we gave it to them before they were in prison? You know, let them learn the scripture so they can have hope so they don't wind up going to prison because they lost hope and they despaired and they did something stupid. Let them learn the ways of God first. 
When I was growing up, they actually allowed the Bible in school. I had to grow up to the generation where they took it away. And it seemed like, this is weird. You should not get rid of this. This points us to Jesus. And Jesus opens our minds to understand things in life. And without that, you could be speaking to someone and you're going, I don't know what their problem is. They don't seem to perceive anything. They can't even understand the Lord is here with us. I said, don't feel, don't knock them too much. You know what? Even the disciples didn't understand the Lord was with them until he opened their minds. You know, what you got to start praying for is that God would open their mind. Because only the Lord, the Bible says no man comes to the Father except that the Spirit of God does what? He draws them. So when your friend is going, I don't believe that, I don't get that stuff, start praying for God to draw them. Just say, Lord, you get them. You start drawing. You open their minds. Because as soon as that happens, and by the way, he doesn't need you to make it happen. He can do it. They can be just like going down the road, and he'll be like, boom, mind opened. And they'll be like, whoa, my friend was right. Jesus is real. And I'll show you when we get to Paul, who was persecuting Christians and didn't, didn't get this whole story. He did say, and last of all, he's going to appear to me as one untimely born. See, this appearing thing is something that I believe Christ does to all of us. He appears to us in that time when we finally get our minds opened up to understand who he is. And he has a way to appear. And you know, guys, isn't it interesting when you hear people's different testimonies how one guy had the Lord appear to him when he was you know, strung out on drugs and the Lord appeared and made him sober. He's got this great testimony. Another person, they never even did drugs. And the Lord appeared to them. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are, what life you came through, the Lord can appear to all of us. Don't put him in a box and say, oh, he's got to do it a certain way. You must go to this church for him to appear. Anybody who says that to you, you know, run. I'm serious, man. They, they tell me, you know, oh, he only appears to the people who, who worship on Saturday. We are the select group that worship on the seventh day. And um, you need to join us or you're, you're part of the bad guys or something. I mean, anyone heard of that group? They're going around. Sometimes they come and they, they actually spy on our service on Sunday. And they leave their leaflets here during our sermon. I just crack up. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Why are you even coming? You said that we, as, we accepted the mark of the beast for worshiping on Sunday in their, in their theology. By the way, they're wrong. But these guys, I mean, if somebody comes up with this stuff like, run! Just run. The Bible says in the last days there's going to be these false teachers, false prophets. And how are you going to know if it's false if you don't spend time in this word? Spend time in the book so you know when the, when the false guy shows up, you can go, you know, that's not right. I took on a few of those guys here one day. They're telling me, you know, the scripture says this and that. And I said, really? It was interesting. I had just taught that very passage and, and the fellow was um, real adamant about it. And I said, you know, that's interesting. You say you're, um, you follow the Lord and Jehovah and you go by these names and I said, do you know Hebrew at all? And they, oh, well, he's done some word studies, you know, the elder guy. I said, well, that's interesting. I said, the very passage you're quoting me is actually, um, I, I, I just studied it in Hebrew. So I thought, well, would you like me to explain it to you from the Hebrew? And the guy was like, huh? And the younger guy was like, yeah, please. And so I did. And after a while, the, the young guy's going, wow, I would like to follow this, this Messiah, this Jesus. That's cool. And the older one's like, let's get out of here. You know, you're, you're, you're swaying my disciple the wrong way. And, and I was like, you're swayed, you're deceived. And, and you know, what is it that sets people free? What's the Bible say? The truth. Don't be afraid of the truth. The truth sets people free. And it's good to know the truth. Jesus is the truth. It's good to know Jesus. And you know, when they don't, it's like a veil. Just pray God opens their mind. And we'll see some more people touched with the gospel. It's a privilege to preach on a beach in Hawaii. I mean, how blessed can I be? 26 years. And we've been 16 years on this beach. On this beach in Hawaii. It was 16, when it was a dump. And nobody would come here. And the Lord goes, you go over there and preach. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. 
That's like drug alley, Lord. And he goes, go. <coughs> it won't be forever. Now, I didn't know it'd take three and a half years to clean it up and see the Lord's hand and fixing it up and making it nice. This is now a family beach. It's even in the brochures. Take your family to this nice little hidden jewel in Kona. And I'm like, I remember what it was a hidden not jewel. But the Lord has ways to use us. And we don't even, it's so cool to have the privilege to serve the Lord on a beach in Hawaii and to proclaim to you Jesus is that way. That he's the one that paid for our sins. And that's good news. I mean, I get to preach what was sent from the very headquarters in Jerusalem to the farthest parts of the earth. I get to proclaim the good news. Christ died for our sins. What a privilege that is, you know, on a beach in Hawaii. Now we can see it go full circle and go all the way back to Jerusalem and, uh, and revisit it and go, yep, came all this way to see an empty tomb. He's not there. You know why? He is what? Risen. He is risen. That's the good news of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, thanks so much for the things what Paul records for us and, and Luke and Mark all write these things to encourage our faith of the eyewitnesses of your son's resurrection. Lord, if anyone not know this wonderful news that your son died and was buried and rose, Lord, died for our sins and rose to be alive, resurrected, Lord, we just pray you would open their minds that they would see the resurrected Jesus. And Lord, just even as you open our minds to, the, to his resurrection, we pray for our loved ones and, and co-workers and the ones, even for our enemies, Lord, that they would come to know that you died for the sins of the world. We pray that especially the ones that are trying to, to that hate our land, that hate the nation Israel, we pray that you would just, you would just let them come to salvation. Lord, even as you converted Saul from Saul to Paul, Lord, we ask that you would do that for all the ones over there in Syria that are just vehement against Israel and against, against every Christian believer they want to just kill us. Lord, save them. That'd be a great way to fix it, Lord. Just, just let them all come to faith and you could convert, Lord. We ask that for our... And you said pray for our enemies. That's the best prayer I know to pray for my enemies is that you would save them and you'd convert them. We ask that now as we close in Jesus' name. And anyone agree with me on that? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me? Let's sing a closing song and send you off in the joy of the Lord. And, uh... Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.